pray together. Father, as we think of all that you've done for us, the name that's on our lips is Jesus. And I pray this morning as we look at your word and as we, we look at the example that Jesus has given to us, the commands that he's given to us, I pray that we would heed them and follow them and be obedient to them. And all these things that you would teach us and correct us and rebuke us and train us, that your word would penetrate our hearts and by the Holy Spirit we would search ourselves that you would search us and that we would be the people that you want us to be that you would be pleased with us and we ask these things in Jesus name Amen Have you ever asked yourself, if you had life to live over again to this point, what would you do differently? What decisions would you change? What things in particular in conjunction with this morning's service would you invest in? If I were to think of things that I wish I would have done, there was a piece of property across the street from where my parents lived that I wish I would have bought. You ever feel like that? You ever wish you bought property up north? I, I wish I didn't throw my hockey cards around like I did. I wish I never would have opened my hockey cards. <laughs> what are good things to invest in? Money is, is one thing. It's an important thing. The Bible talks a lot about money. We, we can pass it along, but, but we can't take it with us. What else? Things like wisdom and character and compassion and integrity, I think, are, are good legacies to pass on. They're good things to leave on to those who will come after us. What you did, what you gave, what you taught what you inspired people with I mean everyone has the potential to invest in their lives things that will be of lasting value right now but how can you invest in something that's totally secure that pays dividends not only for today not only for tomorrow but also for eternity I want to look at that this morning, and if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd invite you to look up Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to have the verses on the screen this morning. And uh, I'd invite you to write them down. We're going to go through them fairly quickly this morning. But Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus delivers this in the Sermon on the Mount. This truth, this counsel that he's giving to those many people that are hearing him say this. You know, we want to invest in heaven. And what is in heaven? We might think, well, maybe in heaven there's, there's you know, great food. I can eat and I can never be full. And I can eat and I don't have to exercise. <laughs> Some of you might think, wow, maybe there's golf in heaven. You know, where there's manicured greens and pristine fairways and the ability to drive a golf ball straight as an arrow for a thousand yards. I think maybe heaven would contain golf. The Bible leads us 
reminds us that there will be animals, the new earth that we're created for. And some of you think that your pets will be there. I've had many conversations with many people in this church about that. Fido, or what's a cat's name? Mr. Whiskers. I don't know. <laughs> Not a cat lover. Just as an aside, if, if, if your cat lives outside, it's not your cat. <laughs> I don't want to be bitter. But there'll be a lot of things in heaven. The Bible tells us that we will receive new bodies and we will live on this new earth and there will be no sin and no death. And it will be perfect. But there are three things that exist now that will exist then, and three things that will be around forever. The Bible tells us these three things are God, his word, and people. And, and, and I say that a lot, and, and I, I want you to know that. I, want that. I say it a lot because it's important. You know, one of the key elements of heaven, God and people, for the the follower of Christ, they will exist in a relationship forever with God and with his people. That's the new covenant that he made, that there will be a relationship. He will be our God and we will be his people. The reality of hell is that there is no relationship with God. There is a, there is a separation from God. When we're created to live in relationship, to live Eternally without relationship is hell. Matthew 22, verse 34 to 40, a few pages over in your Bible, it says these words. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall, have the Lord, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. We are to love God and we are to love others. If you invest in heaven... You're investing in a vertical relationship with God. You're investing in a horizontal relationship with others. But if you want to invest in something that's going to last forever, investing in heaven, these are the things that you invest in, God and his people. And I want to look at how we can do that this morning. Because this is God's perfect will for us, to love God and, and to love people. And so to love God completely and and compassionately above everything else, Christianity is not a, a religion. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we have this privilege of living in relationship with the God of the universe. And that's what this is all about. Otherwise, if we forget our relationship with God, I believe that everything else in our lives is just a dead religion. Relationships are the key to everything. And, and that's in which we want to invest. This is where we build on. And so we love God and we love our neighbors as ourselves. Our relationships and what we do with them will be our greatest investment. So how do we intentionally invest in these things? How do we invest in God? How do we invest in others? I think the first thing that we need to do is that we need to make our relationship with Jesus, the top priority. That's the, the vertical relationship. Now, as I said a few weeks ago, you can say that. You can say that, okay, on my list of priorities, I have God first, and then there's other things that come after him. We can say that, but, but I want you to, to look inside your heart this morning and ask yourself, is that really true? I mean, do I truly prioritize God in my life as the top priority? Or am I just going through the motions? Am I just saying that because I know that's true in my head? You see, Jesus is the beginning of wisdom. Jesus is the, 
recalibration of our lives, if he's not first in our lives, everything else will be skewed. Everything else will be a little bit off. If he's not number one in our lives, if we're not totally convinced that he is number one in our lives, I mean, we could be totally convinced that something in our lives is right, but we could be dead wrong. We could believe that we are doing the right thing. We could believe that we are following what what God's will is for our lives. But if God is not the priority in our lives, the number one priority in our lives, we could think we're right, but we could be totally wrong. You think about the North Star. Got a picture of that. The night sky, it's hard to see, but I've highlighted the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. The North Star is on the point of the Little Dipper, on the tip of the handle. It's the star that has become the recalibration for many people who are navigating at sea, or if, if, you, don't have a, if you don't have your way, you can always look and find the North Star. There's a time-lapse picture that I've included as well that has the tails of the stars as they go around and it looks like it looks like this which is pretty cool God designed all that the north star in the middle it everything else rotates around it because it's directly above the axis that the the earth is spinning on it's another science lesson for you but we, we recalibrate our direction from this. And Jesus, for us, becomes like the North Star. He is the true north. It, it says in Matthew 6, verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. If we are to invest in him, we have to plan to invest in him. We have to seek him first. And And we've talked uh, several times over the past several years about doing your devotions, getting engaged in that, making that a priority in your life, making that a a priority to sit down with the Word of God and and to read it and to pray about it. When you you ask God a question, isn't it often that he, He answers you with Scripture? Isn't it often that when God speaks, and we don't hear him audibly, but, but doesn't God often sound like his word? You ever been reading the Bible as you've been praying for something, as you've been praying for direction in your life, and, and something just pops out at you from the scriptures? See, he, he's the true north. He's the north star of our lives. And and there are negative impacts on your life if he is not the center of your life. And, and there are positive impacts of your life if he is at the center of your life. It spills out into other relationships. It spills out into decisions. If Jesus is first, we have a clearer picture of what God desires for us. I mean, the best thing in your marriage is, is to put Jesus first. Because if you're a little bit off and Jesus is first... He's going to correct you in that, isn't he? I'm going to throw this out there this morning. Is if you're struggling, when we say, do devotions, are you doing your devotions? If you're struggling with what that means, if you're struggling with, okay, how do, how do I recalibrate my life to make Jesus a priority? How do I do devotions? I I'm going to throw that out there this morning that if you want to call me, if you want to email me, and I'm going to put those up on the screen there. There's, my, there's the church phone number. There's my email address. I, I, I ask you, I invite you to, to talk to me because I will try to set something up with you where I will show you how you can be intentional about this because it's that important. The second command Jesus says here is like it. it. We love our neighbor as ourselves. First John chapter 4 says we, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For 
He who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, well, you know, God is not the problem for me. I love God. I demonstrate that. It's people that I struggle with. Matthew 25 says, And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to, to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Loving your neighbor as yourself. It's the next step. Step number two is we need to prioritize important, I might say lifelong relationships on earth. We need to prioritize the horizontal element of our lives as well. I think the first category that falls into that is your family. It's very easy to drift from your family, isn't it? We can take them for granted. They become familiar to us. It's often the obvious that we miss. It's often the obvious that we don't prioritize. Jesus, on the cross, even demonstrated this to us. Make family a priority. When Jesus saw his mother, it says in John 19, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her in to his home. And Jesus was even intentional about his relationships with his family as he's bearing the weight of the sin of the world on himself at the cross. You need to be intentional about that. We, I have in the past, and even as of last night, as I've been working through this sermon this week on relationships, recognizing that we need to intentionally date our kids. And to set time aside where, where we're meeting with them, where we're talking about these kinds of things with them. I need to do that with my wife as well. Their spouse. You ask yourself the question, you know, when I die, who is going to be crying at my funeral? The ones that you've been intentional in building relationships with. A second group of people that we want to be intentional about is, is, is your inner circle of friends. Jesus, we find in the scriptures, chose wisely those people that would, would follow after him. He chose 12 people that he would spend almost three years with. To three years with. And he, it says in Matthew, or in Mark chapter 3, it says, and he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. In Galatians 5, 9, it says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. We need to choose wisely those people that we would call lifelong, important friends. Because if we don't, they have the potential to mess up, as the scriptures tell us, what's good in us. I, I made some bad choices in high school with relationships, which, which could have been detrimental to me if it were not for the grace of God and for the prayers of God's people and my family and the counsel of good friends. I, I dated a girl in high school who is not a follower of Christ, not a bad person, great girl, nice girl, beautiful girl. But she was not a Christ follower. And, and I thought, you know, well, I will win her for Christ. I mean, she will get saved for sure. Sometimes that works. But think about that for a second. Who was the priority in my decision making in that case? Was it God? No, it was me. I also worked a lot of Sundays. I, I missed 
church for legitimate reasons, I thought, at that point in my life. I wasn't making God a priority, so I wasn't intentional about a devotional life. And, and as I'd come home, my Bible, if I were to remember, my Bible sat on my desk all week. And I opened it on Sundays, Sunday school and church and Sunday morning and Sunday evening if I was there even. Other people were preparing my meal for me. Other people were feeding me. And, and the only source in my life, and when I, and when I had given it up, I, I had nothing. I began to slip in my life. The only source of truth in my life was probably Sunday evening at that point. Maybe youth group occasionally. I was not prioritizing relationships that were healthy to me. I was not making church a priority. I know that some of you here today that this is your only nourishment for the week. And you wonder why you're slipping. Because we're not meant to receive all of our teaching from God's word on one day. We're to train ourselves in that. We're to get counsel on that. We're to talk about that. We're to, you know, the Bible is in a form where we can read it, we can study it, we can carry it around with us, we can memorize it, we can, we can talk about it. It's meant to be discussed and it's meant to be read and it's meant to be uh, poured over every day in our lives. Take me up on my offer. We talk to our kids about dating. And we've set some guidelines of when and who and, and why. And that's important. And, and I mean, this is the part of the, the baby dedication we had this morning. This is the part where we're at that we, we need help from you. Some of you have played key roles in the lives of our kids and You've been a huge blessing, but you know what? We're not done yet. There's still more work to do. I have three daughters that one day, I'm sure, will bring home a young man for me to meet. And I don't know how I'm going to handle that. <laughs> I've been lifting weights. Um, <laughs> Dave Arnold taught me how to shoot a gun. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> I have a son growing up in a world that's radically more liberal and free-thinking than the one that I grew up in with many girls that are starved for the attention of a man in their life. How is he going to handle that? How am I going to help him with that? going to give you some advice, young people, this morning. Girls, watch how a guy treats his mother. If he sees his mom and he, he grunts, says, you know, where's my supper? Or can I have some money? If he acts like any guy on television today, with no brain or no manners or no spine, run. If he treats his mom like that, he's going to treat you like that. I have a neighbor, and she's a beautiful young girl. She's, she's dated a few guys, and her dad is not in the picture. And I've watched these guys come and go. You know, I'm like, like Wilson from the... Yeah. It, it, but it's been a great training opportunity for my daughters and for my son. Because some guys will, will drive in to pick her up and, and they will sit in the driveway and they will honk. Don't ever do that. Guys, if you come to my house and you're, 
you got a date with one of my daughters and you sit in the driveway in your car and you honk the horn, you will get a date, but it will not be with my daughter. <laughs> you know what's good? Ask her father before you leave when you want her to be home and then do it goes a long way don't let somebody manipulate you in in dating in relationships you know if you do this then i will do that or if you don't do this i won't do that i mean if if you leave me you know i'm gonna kill myself that'll work You're going to be a great boyfriend when you're not around. Don't let someone manipulate you. You know, choose your relationships wisely. Proverbs 22 says, Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Somebody who's going to manipulate you with, with anger, I mean, you're going to get caught in a snare. There's going to be a guilt trip every week. If someone uses anger to manipulate you, run. Don't get involved in that. You know, there's no perfect husband. There's no perfect wife. None of us are perfect. But choose wisely. By application, how about this? We've been witness to a baby dedication this morning. How about instead of being intimidated by teenagers saying, I don't understand them, recognize your commitment to all these families here this morning who have committed their children to, their Lord, to the Lord, who have committed themselves to the Lord, who've called upon you to help in this situation, and take our commitments seriously and build into these young people Build into these children. I know many of you do that, but we all need to do that. Thirdly, in this category of loving others, we need to prioritize in our lives those who don't know Jesus yet. One of the crystal clear commands of Scripture, uh, of the Gospel, is our mission that we are to make disciples. It says in Matthew 28 that we are to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. As, as much as these other relationships are important for encouragement and, and strengthening and for fellowship, and, and they need to be lifelong, we need to constantly be connecting our lives to those people that don't know Jesus yet. I'm going to talk about this at length in two weeks, so I'm not going to spend any more time on it this morning. But I can't talk about loving our neighbors without prioritizing these people in our lives that don't know Christ yet. The third point I want to make about investing in heaven is this. We will not get along with everyone. But don't shut the door on relationships. Romans 12, verse 17 and 18 says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do as what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as far it depends on you, live peaceably with all. You keep it open. We live in a throwaway society. If, I'm, if any of you have ever had any uh, electronics break down. It, you'll know that the people that fix them often say, you know what, it's cheaper just to buy a new one than it is to fix this old one. It, it, things are not made today to last 20 years like they used to. If you have a TV or an iPod or, or, or a printer or even appliances, people will just say, you know, it's cheaper to get a new one than to fix this. But much of our world, unfortunately, has taken that philosophy and they have infused it into relationships. We live in a throwaway society, so relationships, we, we can throw that away. Don't do that. 
don't shut the door. I mean, the world is smaller than we think, and we never know when we will see someone again. Uh, we'll be in the same class where we might work with this person again, maybe even go to church with. And it is highly likely that you will have some type of interaction with a person that you got close enough to have a conflict with in your life. So don't think it won't happen to you. Expect that you will walk across certain bridges again. Expect that you will keep doors open so those relationships may never be the same. But there's an opportunity for healing to take place. I want to leave with a question. If I had to live life over again, what would I change? And recognize that you can begin to change that today because you have the rest of your life. The Bible tells us, store up treasures in heaven by investing in, he- in, in healthy relationships. There's that vertical relationship. There's the horizontal relationship. Store up treasures in heaven by building into those. And it will pay great dividends, not only for this life, but also for the one to come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you've given us this example in your word of Jesus. And the relationships that, that he had, he, he was always investing in that relationship with you, Father, that he, he was open to your leading and he did nothing in his life that wasn't in obedience to you. Father, I pray that we would have that same kind of relationship that we're pouring into this life, this uh, relationship that is, that is of utmost priority. And Father, also that we have an example in Christ's life of the fact that he has chosen wisely those who he would invest in. Those lifelong relationships that, that we have with, with family, with, with those close friends around us, the, the people that desperately need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, may we choose wisely there. And Father, recognizing that we will not get along with everyone, we will, we will have conflict, we will have barriers between us in relationships that, that will sever the relationship for, for what it was, but Father, we recognize that you call us to live peaceably with everyone. And I pray that we would prioritize that in our lives too. So Father, we lift this to you and thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for its instruction. Thank you that the Holy Spirit is communicating these things to us and will continue to communicate that with us. So Father, we depend on him. We, we need him to teach us what you would have us to know and apply it to our lives that we would grow and that we would know you more and bring glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen.